All right, welcome back. Uh, our next panel is on the SEC's focus on cybersecurity, disclosure, enforcement, key guidance for 2021. Um, and let me start by introducing our moderator today, Jerry Hodgkins, who's a partner at Covington and Burling. Uh, he was previously an associate director in the SEC's enforcement division. Uh, he served there for over 20 years and oversaw more than 100 enforcement matters. Welcome, Jerry. Thanks, Bruce. Also very pleased to be joined by Arsen Ableyev. He's a senior counsel in the SEC's enforcement division, and notably, he serves in the SEC's cyber unit, uh, where he leads investigations and litigates cases focusing on cybersecurity and technology. Arsen, super uh, uh, excited to hear from you today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, very pleased, Austin, to now introduce Michael Birnbaum. Michael's a partner at Morrison & Forster, and he previously served at the SEC for over 11 years as senior trial counsel, where he worked closely with the SEC's specialized investigative units, and we're really psyched to have Michael here today. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Liz Gray is a partner at Wilkie Farr, where she's partner uh, and co-chair of the Securities Enforcement Practice Group. Her background is really interesting. She served as a senior official for 12 years at the SEC in the Division of Enforcement and the Division of Corporation Finance and as a counselor to Chairman Levitt, uh, but also has a really unique perspective on legal, issue, legal issues from her past roles as general counsel and chief operating officer of a neuroscience company and as a founder of an early stage biotech company. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Bruce. Great to be here. And finally, uh, I'm really pleased to be joined by Lauren Reisner. Uh, he was a partner. He is a partner at Paul Weiss. He has an extraordinary background and experience in both the SEC and the DOJ worlds. He previously served as chief of the criminal division in the SDNY, also as deputy director of the enforcement division of the SEC. Always great to have Lauren with us. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Bruce. Great to be here. All right. I'm very pleased to turn it back over to Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bruce. And, and thanks, everyone. Great to be here today and really appreciate everybody's interest in this. As all of you guys know, the increasing presence over the past five years of cyber threats to U.S. financial services firms and public companies is undeniable. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent battling threat actors, yet breaches are still an everyday reality and a drag on the U.S. economy. While this trend has been happening, the SEC has pushed the securities industry to protect customer information from cyber incidents, and public companies to be transparent with their investors about, about cyber threats they face. And we know that will not change with the new SEC leadership because they have told us that. In September, for example, Chair Gensler noted in a speech, and I'm quoting him, today's investors are looking for consistent, comparable, and decision useful disclosures around climate risk, human capital, and cybersecurity. And he suggested that rulemaking in these areas would be forthcoming. And the enforcement Enforcement Director Gabir Graywall at a conference last month stated, and I'm quoting, cybersecurity is a critical issue in our securities markets and our economy as a whole. And we have been vigilant, the SEC has been, in both ensuring that market participants safeguard essential data and systems and pursuing public companies that do not reasonably disclose material cybersecurity incidents. This includes charging public companies for misleading disclosures about cybersecurity events and for inadequate controls related to such disclosures." End quote. No doubt on the front lines of this effort by the SEC will be the Division of Enforcement Cyber Unit. Created just over four years ago, the Cyber Unit has been and will continue to be the key driver in the SEC's Cybersecurity Enforcement Program. And we are very fortunate to have a member of that unit here to discuss how the unit will advance the goals of the SEC in several areas, including cybersecurity. So I wanna welcome Arson and, and let him know we're really happy to have him on this panel. Arson, would you mind starting off our panel by talking about the unit, its, uh, its mission and what we could see perhaps in the coming year from your group? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jerry. Um, so before, before I uh, speak substantively, just want to provide our standard disclaimer. Uh, the views that I express here are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the commission staff. Uh, with that said, um, good morning, everyone. Really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm happy to talk about the cyber unit. 
um, and kind of the work that we do. Uh, so very briefly, the cyber unit, as Jerry pointed out, uh, started up about uh, 20 in 2017, towards the end of 2017. Uh, we currently have 30 staff across six offices around the country um, in D.C., Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And uh, the three main areas of focus for us in the cyber unit are digital assets. Uh, so things like crypto, uh, digital assets, uh, ICOs, initial coin offerings, decentralized finance. Um, the other, the second uh, main area of focus for us is cybersecurity. That's what we're, talk what we're here to talk about today. And uh, the third one is uh, improper trading using uh, digital infrastructure, digital um, uh, things of digital nature. So like insider trading uh, based on material, non-public information that was hacked, uh, manipulation using electronic platforms, et cetera. Uh, quick shout out, uh, the chief of the cyber unit, Christina Lettman, is participating in a crypto panel at this conference later on today. Highly recommend that. Uh, for folks interested in digital assets. Um, so um, now to focus in on the cybersecurity part of our work. So if we look at cybersecurity um, specifically, uh, the way I like to look at it is we have two, um, arguably three regimes that are sort of very different from each other, but they do get mixed up a, a, a little bit when people talk about them. Um, outside of the outside of the agency, uh, but um, it, they do actually make a lot of sense when you sort of look at it from the perspective of our mission, the the SEC's mission, um, and that is the most critical part of the mission is protecting investors. So I think you know for all of these regimes in cybersecurity, if you look at it from that perspective, things make a lot of sense. Um, so uh, starting off with um, uh, regulating publicly traded companies. What do we do here? How do we protect investors? Well, for publicly traded companies, our approach is making sure that these companies disclose material cyber events and risks to uh, to their investors, so the investors know uh, what they're uh, you know what they're buying and selling. And uh, related to that is. You know the question of whether these companies have effective disclosure controls in place. So when talking about disclosure controls, um, you know controls policies and procedures that ensure that um, uh, the right information gets bubbled up to the right decision makers um, at the company, um, who will then uh, process that information and decide whether it needs to be disclosed to um, investors. And uh, there's another element of, of the regime that touches the publicly traded companies. Um, I call them issuers, issuers of securities. Um, and that's uh, companies have to have in place controls um, to make sure that the transactions are executed uh, with management's, auth management's authorization and that the assets of the company are used and accessed with management's authorization. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a three-part uh, 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 issuer, uh, issuer regime bucket. Um, the, second, the second bucket is, um, uh, is, is, is the regulations, laws and regulations that touch um, what we lovingly refer to in the commission as regulated firms or registrants. Uh, so those are, those are firms that facilitate the car capital markets in this country. Uh, mostly broker dealers and investment advisors. Uh, for these firms, again, the question is, you know, how do we protect investors when we're regulating these firms? Well, here investors are clients of these firms, and the firms hold personal, a lot of personal information um, and identity information for uh, these clients. So we protect them by requiring these firms essentially to have reasonable controls in place to protect that customer and identity information. Um, and so that's that's what we do with regulations SP and regulation SID. Um, and then and then there's the third third bucket. It's, it's related to regulated entities, uh, but it touches a much smaller segment of that community. Um, that 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 
that the relevant regulation here is called Regulation SCI, which stands for Systems Compliance and Integrity. Um, this regulation, as the name suggests, uh, really only affects a small number of firms that are critical uh, to the functioning of the capital markets in, these in this country. So exchanges, alternative trading systems, clear, some, some of the clearing firms and SROs. Um, that, the, for, for those firms, there are about 50 of them. You know, it changes uh, month to month, sometimes uh, year to year. Uh, but for those critical, uh, critical firms, uh, the approach, our approach is a lot more hands-on. Um, we have specific requirements related to cybersecurity uh, with a strong focus on resiliency, operational capacity, uh, business continuity, and also reporting of significant incidents to the commission. Again, if you think about it from the perspective of um, protecting investors, um, that that should make sense. These firms affect and their operations affect large swaths of the capital market. Uh, so we, we have a much closer, closer eye on these companies. So that's the, that's the sort of 10,000 foot view, uh, if you will. Um, Jerry, uh, I, I don't know, is that uh, let me know if you want me to go into detail, into more detail on any of those. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Arsene. It seems like you're one of those units that really crosses the divide between the registrant community and the public company community, which I, and when I think of the specialized units, I think they're sort of more cabined in one or the other. There may be some exceptions, but it seems like your unit's digging really deep in both. Um, yeah. Can you can you give us a sense of like oh, what's on the on the horizon for you guys? Like, are there particular areas that you're focused on? Uh, are there certain types of cases that we can count on? Um, you know, just anything you can share. I know a lot of it, your investigations are non-public, but trends would be great to hear about. Yeah, I think I think the unit's work will continue to get, dig deeper into the area of cybersecurity-related disclosures and disclosure controls and internal controls. Um, at public registrant or public issuers, publicly traded companies, uh, and for for registrants, I think we'll continue on the path of looking at both the hygiene, uh, cybersecurity hygiene that firms have to protect their customer information and client information, as well as how they are responding to cybersecurity incidents. Um, so, you know, uh, so th those two, to my mind, are, um, you know, related, but, but uh, somewhat separate areas. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, my sense is uh, you'll be seeing more, uh, more of the actions that we've been bringing fairly, uh, fairly recently in, um, in, these, in these areas. You know, the, 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 the SEC has such a broad area of jurisdiction and so much responsibility in a lot of different areas in terms of policing the markets. Do you get a sense from, I know it's relatively early on in the new leadership, but uh, any thoughts on where the cyber unit is going in terms of uh, focus, uh, whether the, the commission's focused on your area, like you, are they going to ramp up in staffing, anything that you can give us in terms of where, where you think you're going to be in terms of their priorities, the, the agency overall. Yeah. You know, you know, we can always have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys love to hear feds complain about them not having enough resources. We can always have more resources in the cyber unit, particularly. I would love to see more staffing personally. Uh, and I know that, you know, as you pointed out, uh, both the chair and the director of enforcement are very focused um, in, on, on, on cybersecurity, and they've pointed that out publicly. Uh, so I'll, I'll express my hope that, you know, we'll, we'll be beefing up in the, you know, in the resource area. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, I'll also say that it's not always just sort of uh, staffing resources, but, um, I think I think the commission is doing a good job uh, providing tools and experts uh, for us to work with these cases. These cases often are 
very complex and, and sophisticated. And, um, you know, on that front, we're doing really well. And, and uh, yeah, I, I do hope the staffing, uh, the staffing increases over time. And you're, are you in Chicago? Yes, yes. Chicago actually is, um, if you look at the cases that we've been filing, they've been coming out of Chicago very, uh, you know, at a, at a pretty steady, steady click, uh, cybersecurity cases. We have a, uh, a good cyber pod in Chicago here that's, uh, that, that is doing, investigating a lot of these cases. And, um, and we have a really good relationship with the exam program in Chicago, which has, you know, really, you know, to my mind, I'm parallel when it comes to cybersecurity and understanding uh, technology. And we have a few folks um, in Chicago who are part of the uh, exams programs, technology control program, um, who are sort of, you know, next level experts um, in cyber. And uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm in Chicago uh, and it's a great, great place to be uh, if you're interested in cyber and you're at the SEC. That's great to hear. Um, well, you know, we, I think as you described, there are really two key areas and they have different considerations, really the public company space and the, the registrant space. Why don't we turn now to, to Lauren, who's going to dive a little deeper into the public company space and describe sort of what's been going on over the last few years, the, the kinds of cases they've been brought and, and sort of the guidance that the, the SEC has, has uh, given to public companies about cybersecurity. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so there have really been three uh, main uh, public company cyber incident disclosure and disclosure control cases over the last three years. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with them. Uh, the Yahoo case in uh, 2018, uh, the First American Financial Corporation case earlier this year, and the Pearson case from uh, this summer. I think those were two of the recent cases that uh, Arson was uh, uh, referencing. But what's really interesting about these three cases is when you, you look at the substance uh, of the cases and the, uh, the principles articulated in the uh, uh, orders instituting proceedings, you can really trace it back uh, pretty directly to the February 2018 statement and guidance that the commission gave on um, cybersecurity disclosures uh, and disclosure uh, controls. So I think what I'm, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the 2018 guidance because it really is at the heart of the enforcement activity and then link it to the three actions that have been brought over the last uh, three years. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that when you look at the 2018 guidance, it both gives you a perspective as to the enforcement actions that have already taken place and also what maybe we should reasonably expect um, in the future. So uh, there are seven or eight uh, key uh, principles underlying the February 2018 guidance. Let, let me just go through them uh, briefly. Uh, the, the, the basic proposition uh, that the uh, guidance starts with is that the frequency, magnitude, and cost of cybersecurity incidents makes it critical that public companies take all required action to inform investors about material cybersecurity risks and incidents in a timely fashion. And obviously, I was quoting from the, uh, uh, from the guidance. When you look at the guidance, it's really disclosure controls that are central uh, to the uh, to the guidance, the process uh, is really key. Uh, for example, the guidance states that disclosure controls and procedures are expected to provide an appropriate method of discerning the impact that cyber incidents may have on the company and its business and financial condition and results of operation, as well as a protocol to determine the potential materiality of such risks and incidents. Again. The process is the key, that's true in the guidance, and it's also true in the cases uh, that I'll describe in a moment. And part of that process, and Arson already alluded to this, is the communications between the technical personnel who understand the, the cyber uh, issues from a technical and infrastructure perspective, and the disclosure personnel who need to understand those issues well enough to make good disclosure uh, decisions. And the, 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 the guidance emphasizes, and sort of the cases, that it's critical that technical personnel responsible for cybersecurity 
communicate fully and effectively with corporate personnel responsible for evaluating disclosure uh, issues. In the words of the guidance, the controls are expected to quote, provide for open communications between technical experts and disclosure advisors and timely disclosure. Hey, Lauren, can, can, I, inter can I interrupt you for one second? Ask Arsene if that's his experience. Are you seeing that issue in your cases where there's a disconnect or there's an issue uh, in the disclosure process? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, I think, you know, the, the open communication be between the technical experts and the disclosure advisors and decision makers is really critical. And it does bubble up in, um, in a couple of cases uh, where, you know, someone at the company knew a piece of information, had a piece of information, and that piece of information didn't bubble up or didn't or was not was not explained to the decision makers sufficiently such that they're able to um, you know uh, decide whether or not this information needs to be disclosed to um, to the investors and and Pearson and uh, First American are the cases I'm thinking about I'm sure um, I'm sure Lauren will uh, will will touch on great thanks so another element of the uh, disclosure that's emphasized is board involvement. And it's very clear from the disclosure that the expectation is that the board of directors will be directly involved in cybersecurity risk assessment and cybersecurity disclosure uh, issues. Uh, in the words of the uh, guidance, a company must include a description of how the board administers its risk oversight function to the extent that cybersecurity risks are material to a company's business, this discussion should include the nature of the board's role in overseeing the management of that risk. So two things that the guidance is saying. First is the board must be involved in important cybersecurity issues. And frankly, the company's disclosure uh, at the outset uh, should probably uh, describe clearly mm -hmm. the board's role uh, in connection with potential cybersecurity uh, incidents. There's also a lengthy discussion in the guidance about materiality. Uh, and what the guidance says is that, among other things, materiality depends on the range of harm that such incidents could cause. And there are some specific harms that are identified in the guidance, including stolen information, stolen data, ransomware, and DDoS attacks. And then there's a, a list, probably non-exclusive, of the costs and other negative consequences that should be evaluated from a materia materiality perspective. Let me just tick those off really quickly. Uh, one is remediation costs, including liability for stolen assets and information, repair of system damage, customer incentive programs. Two, increased cybersecurity protection costs. Three, lost revenues. Four, litigation and legal risks. Five, increased insurance premiums. Six, reputational damage seven, damage to competitiveness and shareholder value. And look, it's clear from the guidance that the commission recognizes that evaluating materiality inevitably will involve some subjective judgment. Uh, so having good procedures for evaluating the impact is clearly a very important aspect of the guidance. Next on the timing and scope of disclosure, uh, the, 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 the guidance does fairly uh, acknowledge that there are times that detailed disclosure could compromise security efforts by providing a roadmap to hackers uh, and that companies may need time to discern the implications of a cybersecurity incident and may also need to cooperate with law enforcement, which could affect the timing of disclosure. Uh, so this aspect of the guidance suggests some flexibility uh, by, the, by the commission and the enforcement division with respect to the timing and scope of disclosure to take account of these types uh, of uh, uh, risks. Um, hey, Lauren, can I ask Ar 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 Arson a quick question on that before we go into the cases and how those, those principles sort of translate in the cases? Arson, how do you balance that when you talk, you're talking about a company that has a cyber incident, there might be law enforcement involved, there might even be national security people involved, you're talking about a need to be extremely confidential as you remediate it, but then also there's this obligation to get out there to the public quickly. Um, what, do you have like a particular philosophy about how you deal with that or an approach? 
Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Jerry and Lauren. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's clear that we, uh, as the commission and in, in the Division of Enforcement, we are conscious of this. Um, and we are thinking about it and we're considering, uh, considering these factors um, as we are ramping up our investigations. Um, I'll say that we very frequently, particularly in this space, in cybersecurity space, uh, communicate effectively and work with uh, our partners in criminal, cl criminal law enforcement and national security um, uh, folks. So... Uh, we talk to them. We, uh, you know, we, we take we take in their concerns. We, you know, make sure that 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 their concerns are part of uh, our decision making process. And uh, we're open to companies um, who are under investigation to um, to to raise those concerns and discuss those concerns with us. Um, so uh, it, it's it, 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 it's not an issue that we give short shrift to. Um, on, on the roadmap, uh, on the roadmap part, I'll say, I'll say this, I think, again, we're very conscious of it. We, we don't want companies putting out information that hackers can then use to, uh, to exploit, uh, exploit the company. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and we're on the lookout and again, we're, you know, as we're, as we're, you know, going through our investigations, we're talking to companies about it. Um, but. My experience so far is that by the time um, the company has enough information in front of it to make a materiality determination, a determination of whether um, whether to disclose and how to disclose an incident, um, it it already patched the vulnerability that was used to get into uh, the company in the first place. It reset the passwords of the folks who um, you know who's you know who clicked on the phishing. Uh, phishing emails, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think I think very often that's the first thing that happens. We're very close to the first thing that happens after a company discovers that it it is a, a victim of a, of an intrusion. They plug the holes, and then you know, once the that once the hole is plugged, you should be able to tell investors uh, about what happened. Um, you know, I I also I also point out that there's a trend now that I'm seeing with particularly with technology companies where they're coming out with very detailed, um, you know, almost at the technical level, um, uh, descriptions of um, attacks that uh, they've encountered um, was the idea that, you know, they're coming out, they're not doing it necessarily in uh, Edgar, uh, Edgar filings, but they're doing it on their tech blogs. Um, was the idea that, um, you know, this information will help other companies uh, deal with similar attacks. Um, and again, this is happening after, you know, they sort of figured out where the, uh, where the hole was, plugged the hole, uh, and then they can talk a little bit, a little bit more freely to, to the market about it. Great. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. Great insights. So um, we want to make sure we cover the, the registrant space too, but just to wrap up on the public company space, maybe Lauren, you can give it a, in a minute or so, like what those cases that we've seen, the three that come out, how do they mirror the, the, the policies? And then Michael would like to hear from you on, on solar winds, which is the kind of the, the one that's out there now and everybody's wrestling with. Yeah, very, that's a good segue, Jerry, and I'll try to be really quick. The, the last uh, uh, principle from the uh, guidance that I wanted to cover is the, the, the notion that describing a risk as hypothetical is not gonna be acceptable where that specific uh, incident has right. actually already occurred. And that was exactly the fact pattern in the Pearson case, which was uh, uh, brought as a settled OIP in August of uh, this year. Uh, in that case, Pearson, which is basically an education uh, company uh, uh, experienced an incident that involved the theft of millions of student records, including date of birth information and the email addresses of hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, students, uh, as well as allegedly having uh, inadequate controls and procedures. And in its public filing, Pearson had reported that a breach, quote, may, end quote, include the release of date of birth information and email addresses when the company knew that those types of records, 
date of birth information and email addresses had already been exfiltrated. You know, yeah. hundreds of thousands, if not millions uh, of uh, data pieces had been in, in, uh, exfiltrated by a threat actor. And uh, uh, the commission uh, charged that case on a settled basis. Uh, the other uh, case I should touch upon briefly is the First American Financial Corporation, which is a June 2021 uh, case. Um, in, in that case, the company put out an 8K uh, on an incident uh, that had occurred, but it turned out that the board um, had known about it for a very long time and, and had not been adequately informed by the technical people about the, uh, the scope uh, and nature of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the breach, um, uh, uh, although the uh, the breach had been identified many months earlier, there was a failure to alert senior management and the board, and that was found to be a disclosure controls issue uh, by the uh, uh, by the commission. Yeah. Uh, and and I and I'll just you know the Yahoo case. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Most people know about it. That was the the, the big ticket uh, thirty five million dollar penalty. Case, I should say, the the Pearson case, I think, involved a one million dollar penalty. The First American Financial Corporation case involved a four hundred eighty thousand uh, dollar penalty. Yahoo, you know, was one of the most significant breaches uh, of of all time, uh, with uh, uh, you know, literally uh, uh, tens of millions of uh, dates of birth, email information, other personal uh, data hacked in the middle of a. Uh, uh, a public company transaction that was taking place. And, uh, you know, that's basically a, a primer on what not to do uh, right. in, uh, in the event of a cybersecurity incident. So, Jerry, I'll, I'll close there since uh, I want to make sure to leave time for others. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And, and those two cases, Pearson and First American, are, are great juxtaposition because one's about the disclosure and one's about the controls. And here we have the, the SolarWinds inquiry that we understand is going out to hundreds of companies. And we don't know whether those are, are that those cases, what they're looking for is going to be a controls case or a disclosure case, or maybe whatever they find, you know, and, and it'd be interesting to, to understand more about solar wind. So Michael, why don't you uh, talk a, a little bit about what, what about that, in, that inquiry and, and what we're seeing there. Sure. Thank you. And, and I think the way you frame it is absolutely correct because you have to look at solar winds in the context of what the SEC was saying elsewhere, right? as uh, many of uh, the viewers know, uh, the incident itself isn't the focus of what we're talking about today. The incident itself was a foreign hack uh, of epic proportions back in uh, the end of 2020. Um, but what really got the industry's attention was about six months later, uh, in June of 2021, um, when hundreds of uh, market participants uh, got a request from the SEC, essentially saying, hey, tell us what you know about solar winds." Um, and it asked for a few things. It asked for the impact of solar winds on each recipient. It asked for the recipient's response. Uh, and then there was a broad request asking the recipients to identify other compromises the company um, might have had. And you know, if you just look at the press from that time, you know, blaring headlines, I, I pulled a few today. Solar winds puts companies on notice. Solar winds probe intimidates big business. Uh, SEC sparks fear in corporate America with solar winds probe. I'm sure, Arson, that, well, I hope that wasn't your intent. Um, I know you can't comment, but it certainly uh, was hurt. What, what's that? I just said no comment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly accurate to say that you know, corporate America heard loud and clear that the SEC was focused on the fallout uh, from solar winds. Um, and there was a couple of rounds of, of requests. The, the initial requests, uh, phase one came out, and a lot of companies read, read that, a lot of the practitioners read that as well, um, and wondered, are you looking, is there... SEC looking for more information about the hacks themselves, about who might have been compromised. Um, and there was amnesty offered for SolarWinds related problems. And then there was some gray area, um, some uh, questions about compromises that went beyond SolarWinds where it wasn't that clear what was being requested, arguably, and, and at the very least, uh, the SEC came out with its FAQ clarifying that the same amnesty provisions wouldn't apply there. And in fact, there was a round two request from the SEC uh, that made more explicit uh, what the SEC was looking for. Um, and again, I, as Lauren said, just around June of, uh, of 2021, uh, the first American King case came out. And that really announced even more so that the SEC wasn't just looking at disclosures, um, but was looking, as, as we all knew, at, at, at controls. 
Uh, and I think in response to the SolarWinds inquiry, in addition to the questions about how to respond to the SEC, um, corporations ask themselves, ask their counsel, what kind of policies and procedures do we need in place to show that if the SEC comes knocking, we're doing things correctly? Um, how are we logging impact? To, take, uh, to pick up on a point, I think Lauren and, and you and Arsena were making earlier, how are our tech folks talking to our legal folks and our management and our board? What's in place so that even if we don't get anything, everything perfect right up front, we can say we have the right uh, procedures in place? Because I think the perception is the SEC is not expecting every com company to be invulnerable to, to attacks. These are sophisticated attacks uh, after valuable information. Um, but we don't want to say after the fact that we, we weren't ready. Uh, we weren't ready with a response. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think a lot of us confronted is figuring out how the SEC's request affected different kinds of industries. There is industries where hacks are a regular thing, uh, infrastructure. Then uh, there is there's market participants, registrants who don't deal with this on a, on a daily basis and who might have different kind of information uh, vulnerable. And, and Arson, one of the things uh, we, we've discussed in the past, that I know you can't discuss solar winds in particular, but I think you can discuss this generally, is how the SEC looks at the different kinds of market participants and whether you consider um, you know, what kind of attacks those market participants face on a daily or weekly basis when you're doing a materiality analysis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, it, it, it absolutely is a factor, um, you know, what kind of attack uh, we're talking about, whether it was uh, you know, whether it was well known in the industry, whether other companies in the, you know, in, in your sector are uh, being attacked using this, uh, the same vector. Um, uh, and, and kind of that's, the, th that's the way we think about it. And, and we put it in the context of the business that the company is in also, which you alluded to earlier. Uh, so how important how important is the data that was subject of the attack to your business? Um, I think you see a through line in our cybersecurity cases, uh, for issuer disclosure cases at least, where uh, the more important the data that was attacked to the company's critical business, um, the, uh, the, the, the more likely we are to find materiality and the more likely we are to assign a kind of a, a higher penalty amount to, um, to, to these cases. That, that, that's helpful. And I don't want to step on, uh, on uh, just your time. So I, I'll just respond to that and, and, and uh, skip to one of the takeaways that I thought we all had from this. Um, and that is, you, you mentioned earlier, Arsene, the importance of the tech folks speaking to the lawyers. I think that was important for all of us in the response, both to the SEC's inquiry and just in counseling our clients in general. Um, at least in my case, we have smarter people than, than I am about da data, data breaches, data security. And while we can uh, handle the, the securities aspects of it, um, we found it very helpful to engage internally and externally, the people who really know this tech speak. Just to answer the questions you're talking about, Arsene, um, it's important to actually know what data is important, how it got compromised in ways that at least we found, and I think that's probably true for everybody on the call, it's helpful to have real subject matter experts uh, and not just securities or, 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 or uh, government, former government folks. Uh, it, and that, that kind of interaction made it much easier uh, to speak with the SEC. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And, and thanks, Arson, for those insights. Appreciate the guidance in that space. It's really helpful. You know, let's, let's transition no less important to Arson and his team are the, the registrants and the regulated space. They're very busy in that space. And perhaps you could argue they're busier in that space than in the public company space. So what's going on in that, that area, Elizabeth? Thanks, Jerry, uh, and good morning, everybody. Well, it is a busy space. Um, and it, it's different from the public company sp space in a number of really interesting ways. First, the SEC examination staff is just really active in the area. And as Arson said, um, there's a pretty strong relationship between what the examination staff does and what the enforcement staff does for registered investment advisors and broker dealers. And what's really different from the public company space is the SEC actually has rules in place for advisors and broker dealers that require them to have programs in place. Cybersecurity programs are required for for registrants, and they really are required to have programs that develop a plan for monitoring the threats that are cyber threats, for responding to the breaches, 
and then for understanding information that has to be reported outside the company. So really pretty different construct from public company space. Um, and about a year ago, the SEC's exam staff issued a risk alert. Basically, they've been in to see a lot of registrants and they wanted to sort of put on notice the fact that this was an important area for examinations and enforcement and kind of highlighted some best practices. Um, and then uh, a year later in August, the SEC Enforcement Division ramped up its enforcement against registered for funds uh, and broker dealers, brought three enforcement actions against eight entities um, for violations of Regulation SP, which um, as Arson mentioned earlier, is the required, um, one of the required regs for advisors and registrants. Um, and it basically requires registrants to adopt policies and procedures um, that safeguard customer uh, information and records. Uh, it's a principles-based rule. So even though there's a requirement that there's a program out there for in, in each registrant, it allows the registrant to develop it work with their technical advisors to determine what should this program look like. So it's really interesting. After three years of, of this, no, no enforcement action against registrants uh, for the violations of Reg SP or cybersecurity regs, there is this, uh, you know, sort of sweep, I would say. Um, and in each enforcement action, accounts of the representatives who were working for the firms were compromised and they exposed personal information of customers and clients. To Arson's initial point, this is what's of concern. The protection of investors is a big issue here. Um, and the penalties range from 200,000 to 300,000 in the settlements of these cases. So one example was a case against Cetera and a bunch of its entities, unauthorized third parties accessed cloud-based email accounts used by the advisor representatives who in fact were independent contractors, sort of an interesting component of the case. And 4,000 customers and clients had their information hacked and, and um, it was exposed. Um, there was not a consistent application of Cetera's policies and procedures. The ones that actually existed were not being used properly. Um, per, in particular, there was a reference to the importance of using multi-factor authentication, MFA, uh, it wasn't used and it was cited very early in the in the uh, order against the firm. So one point, you know, in addition to knowing that one, if the examination staff comes in and looks at your program, they may be talking to the enforcement division. Two, if you're an advisor or a broker dealer, you do need to have a program in place. There's no doubt about it. And you need to test it. That's sort of the third point here. Um, so Arson, quick question for you on MFA. <laughs> Um, you know, all the orders that were brought cited MFA and the lack of MFA um, as a problem. Do you, does the staff view MFA as sort of a, a necessary component of a cybersecurity program uh, at registrants? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and we get it. We get it a lot. Um, so it, it, the regulation SP does not require any specific control and um, you know, the way we look at it is it's it, it really a firm by firm basis. Uh, but for MFA specifically, uh, cloud cloud email and cloud storage vendors have been, uh, you know, pushing MFA for many, many years. And why? It's because it's very effective guarding against a wide range of client side attacks like phishing, uh, password brute forcing, password spraying, things like that. It doesn't always work, but it works most of the time, and it's very difficult to get around if you're a hacker. So when you when when you're building, if you're a firm, registered firm, and you're building out your cybersecurity program, and you're trying to decide should I have MFA or should I not have MFA, and you are actively being attacked, you got to think about you know what's the easiest way to protect these accounts. And MFA seems to be it in a lot of cases. But if you don't have, for example, PII in these accounts, maybe you don't need a PII, meaning personal identifiable, identifiable information. Maybe you don't need MFA. Uh, but if you do have PII in these accounts, like in the, uh, the, these folks had in their uh, email boxes, then you should very strongly take a look at it. It's basically an industry standard now. Okay. One, one other quick point from the case um, I was going to make is that 
The, another aspect of these that the SEC found troublesome was communications that went out to the people whose information had been hacked wasn't accurately describing the timing. Um, they are kind of a little bit more like the disclosure cases and the importance of being accurate when you're disclosing the event to clients who have been impacted. Sorry, Jerry. You had a question. That's right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Really, yeah. really uh, thanks, everyone. And over to you, Bruce. Hey, thanks, Jerry, uh, Elizabeth, Lauren, Arson, Michael. Thank you so much uh, and great job on this panel. Uh, the next panel starts at 1010. It's on financial disclosure and accounting fraud. Uh, we'll see you back here in five minutes. Thank you.